All right. Looks like we're on on the air. Um, today we'll be discussing book four of the Republic, a very important book because this is the book where the Just City has finally been completed, and I think it marks a kind of break in in the entire book itself. So I think this will be one of our most important readings, and actually I think one of the most difficult to do, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. So I'm not quite sure how to proceed, and I'm gonna. Be I hope honest. it won't be forced. Ha! Uh, 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 okay. I don't think he was thinking of that when he made the joke. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he was speaking English. Uh, <laughs> okay, let me read the outline of book four, and then I think we're just gonna open it up to discussion from there. Okay. So this is my outline. Both of you, please correct me if you think I'm missing something. I'm going to skim over a lot, I hope. There's still a lot here. So, book four starts with talk about how the happiness of the city is more important than each of the individual parts of the city, which is... Mm, I, I can see reasons why people would be very afraid of that statement. Uh, the next one is um, the city should be neither poor nor rich, big nor small, kind of in between... Then he talks about how his city is one city, which I guess by that he means it's kind of a classless city. It's not divided amongst itself. Then we talk about the importance of education for the guardians, again. Then the four virtues of the city, which is uh, our courage, prudence, uh, wisdom. wisdom. Well, mis wisdom and prudence. Isn't it? And wisdom, moderation, courage, moderation, moderation, and justice are the four Greek virtues. Uh, then then the, finally the great city-soul comparison is made. And then we talk about how the soul is like the city because it's divided soul. We have the argument for the divided soul. And then finally we talk about injustice, bringing the argument right back to the beginning from the challenge from Thrasymachus, later carried on by Glaucon. And that seems to be how book four runs, basically. Um, if anyone doesn't want to start, I have four, three or four arguments I want to make against Plato. Wow. And, and it would be nice if you two would try to defend Plato. Cool. Can we, okay. Before we do that? Yes. At, can I, well, first of all, I'd like to uh, suggest to our viewers that, that hopefully after joining us through this entire journey, <laughs> we, you will offer in the comments your opinions and on the City Soul analogy. Oh. and whether or not you think it's viable or not. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd be very happy to read your opinions and perhaps incorporate them into our thoughts in further videos. Yeah. Uh, you know, as a, side, as a side note, I, I mean, you could also, does it have to be a platonic city soul thing? Just, mm -hmm. I think it's interesting to think about how, how a city affects the way you live. Mm -hmm. Like how it does reflect itself in the way that you are. Mm -hmm. anyway, so I think that could be interesting too in the comments. So. Mm. Cool. Actually, yes. yes. We'd like to hear your opinions on either one of those. those. And also, just kind of a, a little bit of backtracking. I mean, this chapter made me wonder if we weren't missing a level on the previous one. Uh -huh. Interesting. What's that? Because this whole thing was about you know comparing the city as... You know the soul essentially. You know, it's the city soul analogy, which makes me wonder if there wasn't a soul component and to some of the things that were said in the previous chapter. Or some of the things that that he said in the previous chapter, while they seem to fail on the city level, they almost make sense on the soul level. Mm -hmm. Anything in particular you want to? Well, like, Medical ethics. Ah. Ethics was the one that kind of struck me. You know, on the city level, he said, okay, if you can't do your job to help the city die. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 but perhaps on the soul level, well, you know, if you have cancer, you know, if you have, like, cancers in your soul, well, if you can imagine this, you have, there's parts of your, of your psyche that are messing with you, with you. Uh, you know, you have delusions or whatever. Some, so something negative in there that needs to be cut out. Perhaps it is better to cut it out. Uh, perhaps, perhaps if it's you know that part of your psyche isn't 
and doing its job. It's not benefiting being the whole of your soul. Uh, getting rid of it is the best option. Yeah, I mean, I was going to talk about that a little bit today. I think that some of his arguments work a little bit better for a person because, Grant, honestly, I don't want my lungs rebelling against my brain. Um, I would hope that they're not like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm so sick of you brain exploiting me. But so, your lungs need more breathing room. Yes, they need more breathing room. Like a, my little lung Hitler yeah, yeah. down there, he's like, oh, my God, I need more breathing room. So um, they go and rebel against my brain, thus giving me a stroke. I mean, so, I mean, like this, I mean, I don't want to go too far and say that Plato has this kind of like organic state. Which it's which reeks of fascism, um, but it's close. It's pretty close. So I think right. Some of these arguments seem to do better when you're talking about an individual uh, than you are a city. And that also maybe think of a little bit about. I mean, how much are we supposed to take this city and thing seriously, and how much of this is simply trying to show us something about the soul? I don't know. I kind of finally come to think that. I think he thinks both of them are both... Is, he's taking them both very seriously. Mm. I don't know. I mean, what do you think? I mean, do you think that this whole city thing is simply a way to write the soul large, or do you think he's taking the city seriously? I think I, he is. Yeah, I think he is. I'm just thinking that there are... there We have to look at these things and his arguments on both levels and perhaps critique them on both levels. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I... I take that point, yes. Um, I, I kind of want to offer an argument right about the beginning of, of book four. So can I, can, I, can I read my argument? And I want to hear you two talk about it oh, a little oh, bit. Yes, you may. And of course, lead on. <laughs> by, by Zeus, I will. <laughs> um, so the beginning of book four is this talk about the happiness of the city is being more important than the parts, and that the city shall be neither rich nor small, uh, rich or poor, big or small, and that it is one city. It is concerning this part of the beginning of the book. I think this whole beginning of the book is basically this, that the, the city is unified, and it is one city. It is not two cities. And by two cities, he means that the classes are, are divided against themselves in the city. Now... <sighs> Okay, so I, I'm going to read this argument, and I want you to really, really take Plato's side on this. Okay, so tell me, tell me, tell me what's wrong with this. Okay, so I'm going to. The title of this first doubt I have against Plato is: Is Plato's city really one? Okay, so I want you to let's think about the life of the bronze man. Um, let's let's just say this man is a potter. I don't know. He he could be any one of the bronze occupations. Well, he sounds like a bad guy right off. I mean, he took the money. Yeah, Mr. Potter, he yeah. did take the money. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> ignoring <laughs> that, wow. I wasn't expecting that joke, but it's pretty funny, actually. Okay. Um, Mr. Potter did take the money, but then again, he can't control his desire. He's so greedy. I mean. He's full of desire. <laughs> He's full of desire. Yeah. So let's take this Potter. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Potter, if you will. Mm -hmm. He's a, he a man. I'll make him a man. So let's just say first, let's, let's think about this this man. Like, what is he doing, right? Okay, so first he came to the city because he could not live alone. Okay, um, you know he needed he he's he's not a beast or a god, right? But I guess if we had to guess one, he's closer to a beast than a god. At least that's where Plato will leave him. What with that bronze soul of his, right? How did Plato, by the way, determine? that. Um, the best guess I have is that he saw that his desires overruled his reason. Which is not to say that this bronze man doesn't have some reason, but that his reason is a slave to desire and cannot judge what is best for the whole of his life. That's why he was thrown into the bronze class, right? I guess, you know, he put that Harry Potter hat on him and then the hat kind of sentences them there. So, so Plato takes no care to educate this man, or even to believe that he's capable of deciding what's best for him. Um, this man has people to think for him. So perhaps is this why he lives in the city? Because it's easy to leave all the important choices up in life up to people who think for you? Or is this some kind of self 
fulfilling prediction of Plato, that the man, the bronze man, can't make choices for himself, so he will never have a chance to, so he can't practice making choices, so he'll never be given a chance to, to given the chance to make choices, right? He's just self-fulfilling prophecy of slavery. So what does the bronze man do? Well, he's dominated by his desires, mostly, so we can guess lots of drinking and sex, perhaps stealing money, too. Um, but what about work? Well, he makes pots and only pots. But why? I guess this is kind of the crux here. Why, why is he doing it? Well, he can't be afraid of being too poor. Um, the city will provide for him. It can't be to make him rich, though, either. Plato won't let him be rich, and the guardians will tell him that, too. They will tell him that it's in his best interest not to be rich. Well, not his best interest, but the city's best interest. I guess my first doubt here is, will he be smart enough to know that they know better, these guardians, and smart enough to know that he should love the city more than he loves himself? Probably not. Maybe Plato could say that because rich and poor are relative to everyone else, you should work to make everyone richer and thus make yourself a little richer in the long run? Or perhaps I'm sure if Plato just told him that the doctors will leave him to die if he doesn't get himself in gear, he might have some motivation. Mostly fear. He can't be living the just life, though. His soul is simply out of, left out of balance. Only the guardians get to be wise and just. He won't live his life simply for the art of the craft that he's been chosen, or that has been chosen for him. Or at least Plato thinks he won't. That's why he prohibited him from being rich in the first place. If given the choice, he would rather loaf around and do nothing than do his craft, right? That's why we can't be rich. So here's my, here's my first attack now on Plato, after all this. I think Plato has ignored the plight of the bronze man, the bronze class to his peril, the city's peril. So let me pose a question. If there was a war between Plato's Republic and another richer state, what is to stop that state from telling the potter, come to my state and you will be richer than Xerxes of Persia? Will the potter be able to contain his desire? I know Plato is describing an ideal state of affairs, but what is it in this ideal state that prevents the potter from betraying his city? Only the noble lie? Isn't, the bron isn't he bronze precisely for the reason that his reason cannot see the whole and think about the whole by himself? So this is my doubt. So why is it that the... What, what on earth is stopping the, the bronze class? from betraying the city. Obviously, he doesn't think that they're going to be loyal to their techne, and he doesn't think that they can reason well. So why does he think that this external enemy can't buy off his bronze class? Well, he thinks that they're not, they can't reason well. Well, if he, they were completely without, without reason, they'd just be, you know, swine running around and hurt by the, the auxiliaries. So I guess like that's why I kind of added that he did that he it's it's not to say that he doesn't have some reason but that his reason is a slave to his desire and that he can only see the part and not the whole right? He, he He's going to be attracted to that get rich quick scheme or you know just his, his instantaneous desire or his immediate gratification as opposed to the city's gratification. So I'm, I'm going to grant him some reason here. He, he, obviously, he can make pots. So basically, you're saying that by Plato's definition, he would be unjust. Yeah, he's, he, I think Plato sentenced him to an unjust life and left him the flounder there. And I think that by doing that, he's left his city open to attack from the outside. Because what is stopping this bronze man, who he knows can't control himself, from being bought off by another city that says, well, in our city... King Xerxes over here is going to give you potters all the money in the world. Just come over here. Hmm. Why think, on earth? Why not? I think... I can't imagine Plato saying that in my perfectly just city, the, the largest class of people are unjust. So I'm thinking he's probably assuming that they're going to be just. Uh, so they're going to be wise. Not as wise as the Guardians. And, but they're going to be wise enough enough to realize that the Guardians are wiser than them, and this is how, this is his thing about moderation, Should they'll be of the same opinion of the Guardians. The city is just. Hmm. The city is just, remember. The, yes. only peop the only people in the, in the city that are just, though, are the Guardians. The city itself is just, 
The bronze class, though, they represent desire. They aren't just. I'm, I'm really... I know I... I understand where you're getting this well. It seems blatantly this way in the reading, but I don't think... I think if Glaucon were to say, hey, so Socrates, you mean the largest portion of your city will be unjust, right? I like, think he thinks so. You, I really do. I honestly do. Can you tell me why you think the bronze class is just? Uh, the only reason I can think of it is because, because I can't see Socrates saying, yeah, okay, everybody's unjust except for the Guardians. I think he well, thinks... Well, it's just. I think, it's, it's even, I think it's even more cynical. <laughs> I think he thinks that they're incapable. He thinks that they're not even... They're, they're more beast than man, almost, right? They're, they're, they're incapable, so he's not even going to try. And th this is where Plato gets his realism, right? I think people can call him kind of a, a political realist sometimes. He's looking... He's not totally an idealist here. He's looking at harsh realities, so he's going to basically... <laughs> he's throwing away basically 90% of his city to... I think an unjust life. I mean, he doesn't. He doesn't talk about the education of the uh, the bronze class ever. The only education we've talked about is the education of the guardian class. Yeah. So, what on earth is stopping the city, these people, from being bought off? Oof. Um. Is it the, is it the noble lie? I was gonna say it's gonna have to be some kind of. Noble lie-ish kind of, because I do think he thinks. I don't know why he thinks this sometimes. That he thinks, I think he thinks that the bronze class will have enough reason to realize that the silver and gold are their betters. Yes, I mean this is going to be where where it. But why? I mean. Yes, I mean, like, I, I can see how you could, like, when you're talking, Jesse, about how this works better as a as a metaphor for the, the, the body, mm. I can see how you could train your desires because, you know, by denying them or, or, or not doing something, you kind of train your desires to fall into line in a certain mm. way. But these are not, this is why, this is, this is, I also want to use this example to say that the city-man parallel doesn't work now because these aren't just desires. These are men with little bits of reason and little bits of spirit and little bits of desire also in them. Okay, so a lot of things are breaking down here, but I just want to say that this, these, these, these what, what on earth is going to stop them from, or at least, I, I know that they're going to have, this is the ideal state, so let's give Plato that. He's, we're talking about the absolute most ideal state, and these people think that they are their betters and they have to fo follow them. But, I mean, obviously, they're only ruled by their desires. That's why they're in the bronze class in the first place. So, what, are they totally in control of their desires now? If they are, then, well, what are they doing in the bronze class? Oof. I, I'm, wow. I'm just going to have to pick up Plato's side here and say, I'm assuming the bronze class will be, will they'll be able to recognize somehow that uh, the silver and gold are their betters, but they won't know why they're their betters. They'll just they'll just kind of intuit that they are somehow because they're not smart enough to get, at least according to Plato, I think they're not smart enough to get at that level of things. But it's going to have to be something along the lines of the, the glory of living in such a wonderful city. I mean, that you would never leave this, this wonderful city. It's just too glorious. The 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 silver class are unbeatable in war and and the gold class are making rules uh, about things that are just way too complex for them to understand but things are going well they're doing they're winning in wars they're making their they're making their pots they're getting their money <laughs> Uh, everything's okay. I mean then you look over to Sparta or you know the Persians and like yeah, maybe they have a couple victories here, but they're losing there, and it's got to be something like this. Is just the, the 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 utter effectiveness of the state. Okay, can I just try to poke one little hole in that? I mean, sure. it seems like the class that Plato associates with the lusting for glory and honor or the silver. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't seem like the bronze have this spirit. Like they kind of, but the bronze strike me as like as football fans, like. 
Like the, the like you mean the football players are the silver. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they're going for the gold. Or you know, well, well, I'm mixing so the, the, coach, the, here. Coach, the coach is the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Class. The gold. Like it feels it seems to me like like they're like kind of like Green Bay Packer fans or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're like, Yeah, go pack. Right? But like they're not actually gonna get out on the field. But they really like how well the Green Bay Packers are run. And and the noble lie in this scenario is that when the Packers win, they win too. Yeah. They're all born of the same earth. Yeah. The earth, the earth of Wisconsin. Exactly. The earth of Wisconsin. And then, like, just the, the, the sheer effectiveness of the, the Packers and their coach is what kind of makes them loyal to them. So it's their just total pride in this city. Maybe. Like, I, I mean... When you bring in like a whole bunch of money, and like I guess if you said to a Packer fan, like you, you he would be pretty insane. He'd be like such a loyal Packer fan if he said like I'll give you a million dollars if you switch to the Forty ers or something. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's what Plato's counting on. Like I, I'm sure these other cities who have lots of money, they can't promise that much. I mean, they could promise some. I mean, but they can't promise to make every single Potter a millionaire. They well, can they promise... can they can they can at least promise the prospect of being rich. Yeah. So they could be America. They could yeah. be American dream. Yeah. Mm. Actually, that's kind of also where I was kind of heading here. Mm. I mean, that's the noble lie that we have, right? We we give everyone the prospect of being rich, so they they're still stuck in one class, obviously. I mean, so I guess see what would happen in Plato's Republic is they always just like play videos of Sarah Palin on the TV. <laughs> Maybe like, well, look at America. This yeah, is what, what you a, get. Rule. This is rule by opinion. What this a crazy is democracy. Place. Take a look at this really great guy we have up here in our gold-sold people running the city. He would never say anything like that about Russia. It's just like, <laughs> wow. It's just like Knights <laughs> of the Holy Grail or something, right? Like, <laughs> let's not go to America. It's a silly place. Yeah. <laughs> well, I actually think that's probably what they'd have to do. You'd have to have extreme nationalism. Mm. You know? And you'd kind of have to... To demonize, where you maybe even not demonize, uh, is the the people of others. Just say that you're, they're fundamentally different than us. You know, we're mm. born. You know, we're all born from from the earth of the sun goddess, or whatever you want. I say we're direct descendants from from the earth of the sun goddess, and everybody yeah. else is not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but our our leaders are the crop of the earth, or if you want to. Or some other divine yeah. entity. So we're led by the divine. We're protected by uh, the best warriors around. Now, our country freaking rocks, and everybody else is, you know, they they might look good, uh, but they're fundamentally different from us. Yeah. Like, this is just, it's just, I think, it's, yeah, you're right, Jesse. I'm with you on this. Like, this would be the only thing Plato could say, but, like, I thought the whole premise of book one was to say that, like, desire is never satisfied. It always, it always, you know, it's like Thrasymachus. It wants to, you know, bust out and rule more. And this this would be, like, the secret dark hope of all of these potters. And um, how how would you stop them from, I mean, why why would they have enough intelligence to grasp that the silver and gold are their betters? I don't know. I mean, it just would have to begin with this, like, from birth, this this noble lie being drilled into them. <sighs> I can't think of any other reason why they would grasp that these I mean, other betters. They, they would be filled with resentment, yeah. I would think, if in our society. They'd just be like, and they like, all those stupid guys up in the, the gold people. I'll tell you what's really gold. Bronze is gold. <laughs> Boom, right? That's what they'd be saying. Right? <laughs> Meet the new gold. It's bronze. Right. I mean, just as a modern example of people that are are too stupid to know that they don't know anything. I mean, modern day Republicans who think they know more about science than scientists. Yeah. I mean, that's a perfect example. They're too dumb to know that they don't know enough. They don't know more than uh, they they don't they know they know that they know less than the scientists who study this their entire lives. I mean, this is that. What is that name of that effect where like, the the dumber you are, the more confidence you have, and the smarter you are, <laughs> the less confidence you have in what you're doing. Kim, or there's a name for that, but yeah, 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 yeah. Why wouldn't the bronze people be like that? 
I'll tell you how to run the city. You make it into a big pot. Right. And you put all the people in the middle. Right. I'm sure that'd be like the potters in the street. Like, okay, get the the walls have gotta be clay. It's baked in the kiln. Right. And they'd be like, these guys are the cop they're stupid. They're idiots. Why aren't the walls made of clay? Right. Well maybe this is when he gets to the giving energy just the right amount of money thing. You know, he's everybody's content. Mm. And, and you know, all of your desires, they're there's there's these raving beast men and are content and so there's no need for them to complain. And all I have to do is say, look, everything's going right. Well, and this is kind of what like you, what you're talking about. Mm. Yeah. I suppose if you gave them puzzles and dragons, like <laughs> there's no way they would rebel. They'd be doing puzzles and dragons all day on their iPhone. <laughs> so th- that's what the Romans got right: bread and circuses. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in in your case. Puzzle and puzzles and dragons, right? Puzzles and dragons, yeah. Um, you got to give the people something to amuse them, <laughs> so they don't pay attention to the upper classes. Maybe that's what the gold would be doing. They'd be like, "Well, we need more bread and circuses." There's not pastries and prostitutes. <laughs> no, 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 well, or for Plato, pastries, it would, that would work too. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why we need the luxurious city. Right? Got to, got to distract the people somehow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of curious as where to, because this whole uh, upper class seemed to come into ne- need by trying to make the luxurious city. Yeah. What if Plato had, had gotten to stick with his original city there, which was the city of swines? Yeah. yeah. How would that city have been different and perfectly just? It would. Yeah. It would. It wouldn't. It didn't need any kind of government, right? People were just like, "How can I live until tomorrow?" <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> So they're sitting on the riverbank, yeah. eating dirt or something. Yeah. Eating figs and drinking wine. Yeah. Yes. Okay, figs and wine. Let's <laughs> give, give him some credit. All right. Okay, so I don't know. So uh, let's bring this question to a close. What do you think about my challenge to Plato, both of you? This is something that really comment. disturbed me about, like, why he thought that the bronze sold would be able to grasp the betterness of the silver and gold. I just, yeah, I don't know why he thinks this. It's going to have to be some kind of, yeah, some kind of intense national oil. But, yeah, this is a really good question. I don't think it works. I really don't think you get it across to these guys. Mm. These yeah. guys are born your betters. I, well, I don't know. I guess... Maybe. Maybe we do it. We never, do believe that to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, I haven't been born into a class system. Maybe like if I were born into like India and I was like in the lower class or something, I'd be like, yeah, that's just that's just where I am. I can't marry up. What that that's impossible. Or how about just the UK, the Great Britain for a long yeah. time was a total class system. Well, though, I always thought that these people, well, at least the kind of the way he described. It, the, it was the bronze people would not be complete idiots. This is why this is why they have to test test them and watch them very carefully. He made a very mm, yeah. good point in saying how we have to carefully monitor these people. Well, because they might slip it below our our grasp or our view or whatever he said. Said, and it seemed more like maybe we have a very hierarchical uh, hensachi system going on here. Mm. Yeah. So you know, like you guys. Uh, is your silver people, well, well, you go, you know, okay, your bronze people, well, go to Ko. Um, <laughs> your silver people go to Todai. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. wait so what the gold <laughs> people are going to Waseda? I could, okay, I see where that's going. Yeah, so <laughs> I think so, you forgot and, that, like, actually, the Waseda people went to bronze. <laughs> yeah, and that that's the bronze person talking. Let's just <laughs> ignore him. Ignore him. And, but <laughs> so. In this cyst, so I mean, those those bronze people in Ko would, of course, know that that the Waseda boys were were the superiors. <laughs> well, there, your theory no is way. being disproved right now. <laughs> <laughs> it is very moment it has been disproved. <laughs> the second, the second you said it, because the perfect, the perfectly just Leo Hinsachi system. <laughs> okay. The perfect, you would, they have to say, okay, we have this perfectly fair, fair testing. System. Maybe okay. We'll throw away, away the, because the 
it's not been well enough and ground into your bronze soul, souls that you're inferior. Yet Japan has not been doing its job, bronze people. <laughs> so, so, See, you're uh, just you're just you're just reinforcing my argument. <laughs> <laughs> uh, See, but, I'm a, I don't believe it. But in in Plato's city, the the people in Kea would have been taught since birth <laughs> that, they're, that they're bronze. They're, they're, low, they're, they're lower. <laughs> in Plato's city. In the, Plato's city, huh? Yes. Okay, in Calipolis. Yes, in Calipolis. You, you bronze people have been taught since birth that <laughs> you're bronze people if you went to, if you went to, to Kea. So when you... And we got pat back their hinsachi, and their hinsachi said, "You toda, you you waseda, you you ko." The pre you ko people look at your thing and say, "Oh, I guess I'm a bronze person." Because mm. yeah, I didn't get into I didn't get into waseda. <laughs> I wonder how long that would continue. I kind of want to slip from this to. I can ask. I can throw one last point in there. Sure. Just, sure. Um, I don't know why. I always, I just it seems to me, maybe this is, I don't know if this is true or not, but this it seems like Plato's noble lie contains the seeds of its own destruction in it, uh, um, by the mere fact that it starts. We are all born from the same soil. I, I don't know that that's it's it, it's necessary, but it contains the seed of its own doom in there. Um, it seems like. Given like a, a couple hundreds, hundreds of years, a millennia, that would be the formula for equality of citizens. The fact that we're all born from the same soil, um, and you know, pretty soon gold and bronze would just be like weeded out of that. I don't know why. It just occurs to me. It just seems to me that like it, it, it potentially can destroy itself, given enough time. So basically, once once atheism sets in. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Thing was you have, you have God. Uh, yeah. Remember, their, their God was putting this gold in people's souls. Yeah, yeah. Was, uh, without, you know, if you take the God out of the equation, we're still born from the same soil. Yeah, that, yeah. Um, that does work. But something tells me the strict, strict regiment of education, and I'm assuming this is, is what the Guardians are getting in would be similar to what the the bronze people are getting. And they may not quite as intensive. They might be chusotsu, whereas the bronze people are daisotsu. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know if they're getting any education. Who knows? They're probably just learning how to be potters. Mm. I, I think they would have to have some education to uphold order. Yeah. Like I said, with, with zero, they, there's no reason to obey laws. They couldn't even obey laws. Yeah. As, how would they know what the laws were? <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm assuming they're getting some education. I'm assuming it's as censored third as the same thing the Guardians are getting. I mean, not allowing new music, for example. Damn you, new music. Yeah. Play All right. Noise. I kind of want to slip it. from. I guess. Oh, well, let's just do something else then. Instead of going into my next argument, I want to ask a question then that I brought up that I thought of over here. So now I just might be a fool here and. I'm just going to honestly ask this question, and I want you to answer it as if both of you were Plato. Um, my question is... Bronze soul people don't get to ask questions. Oh, alrighty then. Sorry, I was Plato. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was, you were Plato. All right. Yeah. You know, you're right, Plato. I am not in control of my soul. I do enjoy potato chips too much. Yeah. Um, so, um, what... Uh, what metal do the educators have in their soul? Mm. That's my question. Ooh. Because, yeah, the educators would... Because they're not doing war and they're not leading. They'd have to be bronze. So the bronze people are teaching the gold people how to live. Is that what you're saying? The bronze people are teaching everyone. And the gold people... People are hovering over. Or they're visiting the schools. Well, let me let me try, just try. <laughs> they're, they're visiting the schools, and when they and when they see these the people who are excelling in the bronze schools, they take them they take them to the gold schools. There are gold schools. 
There are gold schools taught by gold people. Uh huh. But don't gold people only do one thing? Oh shit. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> oh, boy. Um, I'm gonna go a different route. Okay. Educators are gold. Educators are gold. So you consider education part of ruling? Yes. Do you think they so well, the either that or they're silver? I, I'm, 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 I'm waffling a little here. Why do you Maybe think they're, they're silver? silver? Why on earth would they be silver? Um, they'd be I'm somewhere along the line, like, like guardians, in the sense Ooh. that they keep out bad thoughts from entering that's the city like, via education. Actually, yeah, because that's remember, you know, the guardian. His definition of courage mm. was the courage to 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 enforce through all means. Mm. Through all means means the consensus of what is terrible. Mm. So one of those means could be through education. Yeah. Okay, so I, I want to I do something a little evil, but I'll do it anyway. So I'm going to fight back. Um, so some, now you're saying to me that they're either gold or silver. All right. So now you think that in this city, the very fundamental thing of this city being that one guy does one task. That is the justice of this city. Don't don't underestimate how powerful that is. That is the fundamental basis of this city. Now you're telling me that not only do these gold or silver people, they're, they're warriors, but in their free time they're also educators too? Um, so, see, the silver are divided up into two classes. They're the auxiliaries, auxiliaries and the true guardians. Right, the auxiliaries fight. The yeah. true guardians do not. True guardians are gold, right? True, no, true guardians are, are still silver. I was under the impression that the true... Because he, he swapped halfway through the book three, right? And he said, okay, mm. and those people we've been, we've been called guardians up to this point are now auxiliaries, all of them. And then we have the, the gold class who, who yeah. we we'll now call guardians. I thought the Guardians were gold, the Auxiliaries were silver, and the Bronze were everyone else. Yeah, that was my I could, understanding. I could, be, I could be wrong. I mean, I think the Auxiliaries are divided into two. Hold on a second. Uh, let me... So who are the gold people, then? Gold are rulers. Those aren't the Guardians? No. Because the Guardians are the rulers, that's for sure. The, how should I say? Some of the Guardians become rulers. Yeah. Um, like, I, I guess, like, but, hold on a second. Mm, 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 hold on. Uh-oh. And suddenly, the Tokyo Sun. Philosophical Society breaks down. Oh, my God. One question has broken us. I was under the impression that the silver were divided into two. I was not under that impression. I'm I'm, I'm looking very. Me. Oh, here. Okay. So, By fa in fashion, those who are competent to rule makes gold in their birth. That's why they're honored. In auxiliaries, these silver or. And wait, hold up. It's kind of interesting. We got two. We do have two classes of so peasants. Oh, we have iron and bronze peasants. Yeah, there's iron and bronze. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. But yeah, so rulers are gold, auxiliaries are are silver, silver, and farmers and other craftsmen are iron and bronze. Um, and then it says, isn't true to call, I mean, he's, the selection of rulers and guardian is my opinion. And, okay, and he goes and he describes the rulers, he says, isn't it, it then truly correct, most correct to call these men complete guardians, they can guard over for enemies from without and friends from within, that's kind of weird to say friends from within, but, but so that the ones Ones will not wish to do harm to others. Those will be unable to. The, the the young who we are calling guardians up to now, we shall call it auxiliaries and helpers of the ruler's conviction. Because 
So that's where he switches it. They're no longer gu- the uh, Zillarians are no longer guardians. The rulers are guardians. Yeah. How about this line here? Um, when he starts talking about the the what what part co- what parts of the city correspond to the parts of the soul, mm. and he says, um, "Or the wisdom and guardianship of the rulers." So here he kind of directly associates rulers with guardians. I mean, I, so e- even if there is this kind of secondary class, I mean, what do we know about them? When has he ever made a statement that the guardians, whether they be silver or gold, mm. are educators? I, I, that's no, more to the point. I want to I I attack you there. Mm. When has he ever said that guardians, no matter what is in their soul, are, are any kind of educators? Mm. No, one, no one, he's never spoken one word about these educators. We don't know who they are yet. I mean... But we might find out in the next book. I think we will get a little bit of a hint in the next book, but I want to know are, who they are. Yeah, the auxiliaries are the dogs keeping, yeah. keeping in bad ideas out of the city. Because they don't, they don't just keep watch for for people. They keep watch for ideas. He says that that, that sounds like educators. Yeah, maybe... Uh, so there's some auxiliaries who fight men... And some who fight ideas. <laughs> I mean, I like what you're saying. Both of you are saying. Like right. they're, they're watching for ideas. But, I mean, the, the fundamental part of the city being... I mean, is he thinking that teaching is so easy that you can be a soldier and teach at the same time? I don't think so. I don't think so. I uh, think is you have, in the warrior class, as you have, just like you have de- dedicated dead swordsmen and dedicated archers... There's you have dedicated at war people who make war on people and dedicated people who make war on ideas because mm-hmm. that's the only explanation. They're still only doing one thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. these people are only doing one thing. They so, be like the idea branch of the army. Yeah, they would be teachers. Yeah. So, your solution to this is in in every class, each class has its own educators. Bronze educated by bronze, silver by silver, gold by uh, gold. That or is it, or is it simply the silver? It's only it's the silver. It's only the silver. So they, they they get all the kids together like a little Jedi training room, right? And then they watch them, and then they start shuffling them around. Yeah. All right. So these, I mean, because I guess my, my 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 worry here is that the person that seems like who is the most powerful in the city is the educator. Or at least has the potential to do incredible damage, even more damage than mixing jobs up, which I think Plato thinks is some kind of incredibly bad thing, which I suppose it can be. But what about bad educators? I mean, he, his whole focus is on the power of education. I mean, that, that is his thing. He's constantly talking about education is everything. The beginning is what forms the soul. It's the most important thing. And yet, we don't know who these educators are yet, even after the city's been complete. Now, we might still find out later, but yeah, actually, who are these people? Yeah, from that opinion, they'd have to be the gold, which is odd, because he does say you can have this city with only one gold person. So in the very end, if there's only if there's only one gold person, it's a king's chip. If there's more, it's an aristocracy. Mm. And it doesn't seem like in your kingship the king is also teaching in his spare time. Mm. Probably not. So that's that's going to be one of my other questions: is who are these educators? Now, I'm I'm let's just hold that question off, I guess, because we we're not mm. finished with the book. So we still are gonna might have a chance to get back to these educators. But I still think that they. Another weakness of the city is that these educators have the potential to destroy it if they are not made of the finest stuff. Mm. So, in my opinion, they couldn't be bronze or silver. They'd have to be made of the finest metal. Platinum. Platinum, that's right. They're even, and, and it's strange <laughs> they are kind of platinum because, wow, I mean, it seems like they have almost the kind of a very powerful influence on everything that happens in that city. I mean, in, in Plato's eyes, I think that's what he sees. So, all right. So that's uh, that's that's my question about the educators. Course, there is a another more scarier option. And, and he has the rules of education so well defined. It's so well manuated. Uh, <laughs> but even the bronze people can do it. 
<laughs> wow. I'm going to go, uh, Plato was a philosopher, uh, and he was interested in education, so that means gold people. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, being a teacher like... myself, gold. <laughs> I mean, Plato kind of, I suppose he educated people in his academy, but I don't think he was teaching the younglings to use the force, was he? Yoda was. I know Yoda Boom. was. Yoda, you tell me gold, Yoda was not gold? <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe Yoda, Yoda was, gold. was gold. Really? Because, remember, the bronze, what happens when bronze ages? What color does it become? Gold. No. <laughs> it becomes <laughs> what color does... tarnish color. Tarnish it. It becomes... Like a penny. I don't know what color does it become. I don't know. Yoda. Yeah, it becomes greenish, right? Green yeah, becomes, becomes Yoda. -y. It becomes Yoda like. Uh, so maybe he's just a bronze guy. Well, considering what he did in like the second Clone Wars and the third movie, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he seemed pretty bronze. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He's, he had to go hide out in Dagobah to get his gold back. Yeah. Um, all right, so let, but at least, okay, I want to go to my next, sorry, all these arguments of mine are, like, focused on the city, which I know is not fair. I'm going to have, my last one, I'll be talking about the individual again. So, and I don't want to crowd on anyone else, but as long as, if you don't, if you guys don't have any debates up to this point of the city, mm -hmm. I want to talk about one more, or maybe two more arguments. So, I was, very quickly, I want to talk about, now, going off of my thing about the bronze guy, um, I want to talk about the meaning of life. In the Republic. Okay. So, it's quickly. Uh, for the vast majority of the people in the Republic, life is not worth living. Most of the people will be bronze souls. They will be unjust and driven by their desires. They'll never be able to see the whole picture and have a unified soul. They'll never be autonomous and never given the chance to be. At least not until, af at least not until after the sorting hat and Plato's Republic places them in Slytherin. I mean the bronze class. <laughs> And not only for Plato, but for Socrates, too. For I believe that he once famously said that the unexamined life is not worth living. Hmm, where did I read that? <laughs> when will the bronze people get the skills and the time to do the examining of their lives? Probably never. Does Plato and Socrates condemn a vast majority of the population to a life that they consider sick and not worth living? I think they do. Statements. Any statements, or are you completely agree with me? Uh, like I said, I still have trouble. Well, I'm still not entirely convinced that, you know, if you if Glaucon just would come out and say Socrates, so all these bronze people are unjust. They're sick, like in your perfectly just city. I still have a hard time believing you would say, yeah. Well, yeah, there's the worst of the lot. They're just swines. I was really, I'd want to slaughter what the city wouldn't work without them. Um, um, I don't see him saying this. I think he's just presuming that they would be like this, this, all people in this city would be just, they'd just be like this weaker model of this just thing. You know, they'd, be, they'd be just, but not the most just. Why are they in bronze, then? It's because they're not as just. They're not as as just and wise as as the rulers. You know, they have to have some in order for this moderation to exist, right? They they have to have have at least a similar thought wave because the moderation was everybody having the same opinion. Yeah. And and if they're all just you know stupid slaves of the desires, there's when the Rulers say it's best for the city if you work, work and make your pots. <coughs> They'll say, "Fuck that! I want to have sex with my sister." <laughs> and they just might. <laughs> okay, well let me let me throw something back at you then. Um, how about if I said um, you can't be a little just? You're either just or you're not just. Okay, how about this? Yes. Maybe they're all just, they're just not all all as wise. You can be a little bit wise. Or not as spirited. Maybe they have 
you know, their spirit ratio. They, they have like a weird, weird like, <coughs> like one of those star graph things. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> yeah. And you have to have, you know, five points in spirited to be silver. Or, and you have to have uh, ten points in wisdom to be gold. Oh, but everybody else has to have, you, know, you have to have three points in all stats in order to be just. So I mean, you're saying they're all basically kind of just, just a little bit weaker than the kings. Mm. Yeah, they're so, not, not as smart as kings, not as spirited as, as the silver. <coughs> God damn. Okay, then I'm going to come back with you with something else that you're not that that I'm going to try to attack you with. Then, okay. then if that's true, how do the bronze people correspond to the desire and the soul of the individual? Because the desire in the individual is kind of this uncontrolled thing. Then they don't correspond anymore. We got another problem. Well, because they're not completely uncontrolled, nor the desire here. Or he said, as you know, we kind of. Ah, oh, shit. Yeah. All right, give, give me a second on this. Okay. Let's give me a second on this. All right, all right. Take your time. I was, I'm, I'm genuinely curious about it. Yeah, because I, I, I don't want – this whole thing kind of loses value for me if we're just call, calling the bronze people beasts. Well, then I don't think they are beasts. I think they have desire, but I think Plato thinks that the reason is in the service of their desire. I mean, they're, they're just basically like you or I. Like, we're not thinking – I mean, in, 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 during a lot of our lives, right? We don't think about, you know, how is this going to affect me? Yes, this Ritz that you're eating, like, how, you're probably not thinking about how it's going to affect your general health overall. You just want to have a good time right now. And, and uh, that's the problem, right? You're not seeing the whole. I, I think that it's a pretty normal kind of way of living, actually, for us. Mm. Plato would probably probably condemn almost all of us to being bronze people, mm. I think. And, and we would be like, oh, I'm bronze, right? But he'd be like, oh, <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, I think uh, maybe Plato would be something along... I mean, it just seems like the, the whole basis of his education system is to just to figure out who's going to be gold anyway. So there's, there's a kind of like... You're born with a kind of alignment. It's like you're kind of like... You have a natural affinity that you really can't change. Mm. And... Um, I mean, like the, the sorting the, hat in, in Harry Potter. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the bronze people... I mean, I think Plato's like, well... They're just not interested. They yeah. really don't care about philosophy. They really don't care about thinking about stuff. They really don't. They, they, they look at these, these gold people and they're like, huh, you like that stuff? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. I'm going to go make some pots and eat some cheese and have some prostitutes and some pastries. <laughs> so, yeah. hmm. no, in order for the city to work, they have to be minding their own business. With prostitutes and pastries. Yes, yeah, so with prostitutes and pastries, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but they have to be minding their own business, right? Yeah. It was the, and this is not the definition of justice? Yeah, that, would be, that would be them doing one task, yeah. That's the minding their business. Hmm. They're being completely potters. But if it's moderation, that means accepting the rule of the other two, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't know, it just seems like Plato... But I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do two arguments here, too, by the way. I just want to make sure. Like Pl Plato here is condemning them to be unjust, whereas Socrates in the Apology is condemning to... to condemn, is, is basically saying they're living on lives that aren't worth living. They're living the unexamined life. Mm -hmm. So in two separate places, and for two separate reasons, Plato is saying these people are living terrible lives. Hmm... I think this is this is the realism thing. I think he's just saying yeah. like these these people just they just don't got it in them. They don't they don't care. And no matter how many times you tell them about like the form of the just and the form of the the holy and so like they're like Cephalus. Yeah. Right. They're, these like Socrates is like, hey, did you hear about the form of justice? And then they're like, I sorry, I gotta go make dinner. The burgers are on the grill. I gotta go. <laughs> Right, and then then they're gone. Right, they really just don't care. Hmm. Yeah, I think this is kind of his, his you know, kind of his gritty, supposedly realistic realism here. Right? So, I, I think I think there's great danger in this so-called realism, though, that that he leaves his his un, his bronze people to the dogs, basically. Yeah. He, he lets them 
and he, he almost takes away from them the ability to even acquire a little bit of, of rationality and autonomy by, by controlling their lives. Um, yeah. he's, as Justin said, pointed out so many times last week, week he's, he's uh, prioritizing results over the process. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, in, in that context, I mean, like, I was going to do an, another one kind of similar to this, and I was going to say, like, I mean, why would you live in the city after a certain point? I mean, first Plato, the entire point is the good of the city. Right, but why would you find that acceptable? I'm just saying, like, well, wh why on earth would someone's if they had other places, if if that was the only city there, yeah. But if if you had to live in a city where the only thing you could ever think of 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 doing good for was just the city itself and not ever yourself, right? I mean, it seems like the bronze people would be the first to be like, um, no, I'm out of here, baby. No way. I, the city ain't more important than me. I'm more important than the city. Deal with it. I mean, that's why they're bronze, right? Yeah, you'd have to have, like, some ultra-nationalism. Yeah, you'd have something. To say, I mean, listen, you know, we are, you know, we're all brothers. Everybody else is different. It's us against the world. Um, if basically. Yeah, if, if we don't win, when Sparta over there is going to come, come and slaughter us and destroy us in our world. Yeah, basically. I and mean, that's the only thing that seems like it works. Okay, so I, I don't want to take too much time with this. I already have taken up way too much time with the city thing. So last one um, about the city, and it's going to be a really weird argument. So um, it's going to be just something that I, I was thinking of, and it, it's it's I, all I want is just your comment about it. If it, if it's it's too weird or strange, so I want to say something that's missing from Plato's city. Um, there's something missing from Plato's Republic. He has uh, techne, but not technology. Um, so Plato wanted his state to be neither rich nor poor, um, as either state would corrupt its citizens. But however, as the surrounding cities got wealthier, his would have to keep, have to become wealthier to a certain extent to keep up, right? Because he couldn't be too poor comparatively to the others, or too rich. That's not what he wants. Why? Because each of the surrounding cities will get wealthier. They also acquire technology, right? As they go along, right? They're going to have different inventions and technology, and they're going to be able to buy and do different things that this city can't do. So technology that will be so strong and powerful that no, no matter how trained and fit his auxiliaries are, they could never defeat the soldiers of this other city. I mean, just imagine. His his soldiers with his with with just kind of swords and shields, and all of a sudden they've got like full armor on or something, right? I mean, this other city's got full armor or, you know, God forbid, tanks or something, right? I mean, it's pretty soon his city's going to lose the edge, right? And so I guess it it kind of gets tricky from there, doesn't it? Um, this is going to have to prompt his city to action, right? He's going to have to take some action. He can't let his city lose. That would be to the ultimate defeat of the city, right? He's going to have to do something about this problem. So as, as technology gets more and more complicated, uh, the, the silver and gold classes are going to have to rely more and more on the bronze class, the creative power class that can actually make things, right? I mean, the guys making the armor and the guys making the jets and the tanks for the, the soldiers and the rulers, right? Because uh, silver soldiers won't know how, to, how their weapons work and they'll have to be trained by bronze technicians, right? I mean, that's how our army kind of works now, right? I mean, the soldiers couldn't make the rocket launchers and the suits they wear. I mean, they're all trained by other people, and no one really knows, you know, what's going into this technology. No one person knows. Um, gold men will less and less understand the economy, because it's going to get a lot more complicated. They'll less and less understand the economy, war, health. And even the media, it's going to get more complicated to keep up. Their, their skill, their only skill is ruling, and they'll be, un they'll be unable to understand the subtleties of each little aspect of their, of their world as it gets more and more complicated, right, to keep up with the other cities. So they're going to have to rely more and more on the advice of the technicians of the, the bronze class, right? And pretty soon, the truth in the, of the world is going to get so complicated that the gold people will have to either 
somehow become experts in all of these different fields or basically be at the whim of bronze advisors who are telling them, well, the economy's like this, and this year's farming crops are like this, but they're not going to have any... All they're going to be able to do is just have... The only thing they could do is listen to these technicians speak because it's so complicated and so difficult to figure out that they won't be able to do it by themselves. And actually, that's the world we live in right now. Um, in other words, it's, it's so... The truth is so difficult now that it's, it's almost impossible to get an overall view of the world. So All I right. think te technology will destroy Plato's vision. Mm. I'm gonna defend. I'm gonna come in on Plato's okay. uh, side. This one, this is kind of a weird argument. So please. Um. So, you gotta remember. Uh, I think to to fight this argument. Um. In Plato's time, uh, Plato made the academy. Right? There were no academies. Cre Plato created the university. Yeah. Um. So, um. Even the guys at the top, the guys advising the president, they're not guys on the assembly line. These are guys who 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 are kind of like maybe to Plato, they'd be somewhere along the lines of philosophers of production. Um, they'd be kind of like gold sold people in production. These are these a lot of these guys advising up at the top. Maybe they spent their time doing some work, but like. These are guys who are working in theory, and 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 Plato. I mean, like Plato in his time, he was like, he was doing math all the time. He's like, yeah, math, math. That's what's gonna really. That's what's really gonna take you to the next level. I mean, I I think he would include all of these theory guys up here in his gold zone, right? So to a certain extent, we we got gold people up at the top still advising the president. They're not guys on the assembly line. The guys in the assembly line are the ones who don't know what they're doing. The guys in the assembly line, the bronze sold people, are the ones who don't know how all the pieces fit into the whole wow. thing. The gold people do. Yeah, the gold people still do. I, this is my. This is the best I can do to defend Plato. Okay, okay, I like this a lot. Now that was a great response. Now let me just, I want to attack you one more time though. Okay. Each of those gold guys knows the whole of their industry. Mm. Okay, they know the whole of super pottery or. Or you know the economy, even though I think it's I think it's impossible for one man to know the whole of the economy. To be perfectly honest, it's that complicated. But let's just pretend that's true. But each one of them only knows the whole of that one thing, right? right. They don't know how po the economy is going to affect the farming because the farming guy knows that, right? And and, and they, they don't quite know it's going to be how they're going to know the whole of the entire state. Each one of these guys is going to be a, the whole of just one industry. Oh. Um, who's going to make the final decision about, no, this year the economy is going to be focused on? And how would he have confidence in that decision? Wow. Um, I think, yeah, wow, I don't know. I mean, each one of them might be, the, each one of these gold guys who are at the top, these scholars, might be able to say, like, well, the farming industry will impact the world in this way, right? He'll be able to say, like, America will be impacted by this level of agriculture, in this way, but he won't be able to say how agriculture will fit in with, you know, I don't know, cars, or, or, or I don't know, like the, the economic change in Japan or or, or Korea. Uh, yeah, it's gonna have to move to higher level of, of abstract abstraction, and like, yeah, you're right. There's no gonna be no one guy who's gonna have enough knowledge to say he's expert at it. Will it? Well, probably you're just gonna have lots and lots of gold people. Well, and you already have committees of gold people, uh, and then one gold person who's, you know, his techne, his ruling. You know, if you have, have your gold people on, on the production committee, their techne is ruling production, and your gold people on the farming thing, committee, who their techne is ruling farming. You can have one guy or a, maybe su several guys at the top who their their techne is making ruling decisions, and they. They'll be the ones who they'll sit there listen up. Their entire job will be to listen to all these committees, is, is and take the advice of all these committees, is and kind of, you know, without actually have you know, this is the the people who could not you put them on a production line they wouldn't know how to work any of it, it but they would have gathered all this, all they need to know about the 
influences of these things on the economy. I mean, from listening to this commute, I mean, this is all they'd be able to do, and they would do it right in Plato's mind, and they would make the decision. They'd make decisions right based on listening to these committees of old people. Yeah. Okay. I accept that. Um, I like both of your responses. Okay, so this, these are my objections to the city. Now, the city actually is only half of the story here. I'm sorry to say. Mm -hmm. um, what do you guys have to say now? Because I, I, I wanted to object to parts of the city, and, and in turn, I kind of wanted to cast doubt on how that reflects on the soul, because they don't, they don't seem like they transfer completely very well. So let's let's move on. I guess unless unless either of you have anything to say about the city, I want to yeah. ask a dangerous question about All the right. city. All right, it's time. It's dangerous question time. So I, I really love, in the beginning, I like book four a lot. Actually, I like it much more than book three. Mm -hmm. um, and book four actually made me rethink book three uh, but and like it more. But that aside, um, one of the most interesting things in the book three was right in the beginning, what was it, 420D, where he compared the city to, like, painting a statue. Mm -hmm. And he said, we can't let... You know, one part of the statue be painted god so gaudy that it takes attention away from other parts of the statue, and it's interesting. I like really like that. I like that a lot because, like, I hear like people say like those statues we see in the museums that are all like white. They weren't really white. They were painted back in the Greek days, and they were probably quite outlandish sometimes. Um, kind of re reminds you that like what we see in our museums is not what what it, what it was like in ancient Greece or in ancient Rome. Um, but that, anyway, um, so I want to ask you. I mean, I'm assuming both of you had the same reaction to me as the same reaction as me, which is whoa, that's very scary statement. Like in other words, we got to subordinate the individual to the state. Boom. I mean, I, can I ask, do, did you both have a similar reaction? Yes. Just a first reaction. All right. So now I want to ask my dangerous question. Um, so, in other words, this Plato is like, well, we should violate the free will of the individual to support the state. And I, I, I think most people would have a, a very bad reaction to this. So now I want to ask both of you this, this question. Should we tax the rich at a higher rate than the poor? Yes. <laughs> right, and now I'm going to have to ask you that second dangerous question then. Why? Because you just said you were objecting to the individual being uh, toned down for the state. It seems like, and I'm, I'm share, I'm like I have to say, I'm sharing this with you. I'm sharing this feeling, by the way. I think that rich should be taxed, but like my... My first answer to this is for the state. Well, remember, or he said we shouldn't paint eyes so that they don't look like eyes. And we shouldn't, fu we shouldn't clothe a farmer or so he doesn't look like a farmer. Mm. Or we should, you know, in other words, we should pay the farmer what he deserves to be pay, paid as a farmer. The farmer should get the, what he deserves as a farmer. Where, so these rich people, well, perhaps they, as rich people, they intrinsically deserve a higher tax rate. <laughs> yes, I mean for the state, right? In other words, <laughs> in other words, I, I, I don't know. I think where we are not totally divorced from this line of thinking. Yeah. That the the individuals need to be toned down for the state. Like rich people are making a killing. They are making a killing off of the community. And they owe a little bit more back to the community because of that. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. What? Okay. Let me try a weird response then. See how you feel about it. So, right. I guess what if I were to say, well, this is going to be like a total lie. So I don't know. You might laugh in my face, but what if I were to say, like, well, the purpose of our state, the ends of our state is not the state. The end of our state is to make the individual people happy. So. Um. Uh. Well, how can I phrase this? Hmm. I I guess I guess I would say like well, as long as the state is basically a tool in which you make autonomous people, I'm okay with 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 uh, taking away 
irrelevant aspects like money in order to make autonomous people, whereas it kind of feels like Plato's state is the state itself is what's going to be happy and autonomous, and everyone else is just kind of gonna <laughs> gonna be like the lungs and the <laughs> the the heart and the legs for the state, right? We're we're kind <laughs> of almost an organic part of it, whereas it seems like our system is a little more free. Now that's not that's it's kind of a lie because we are agents of the state. We are agents of the state, and that's such a lie to say that we're not. But it seems like we're we're at least given enough free reign realm to move around in that we can kind of have more autonomy and live our lives at least some of the time for ourselves. Uh, wow, I like this answer. Can I push you on this a little bit? Yeah, uh, well, I feel like it's going to break if I I'm, push it too hard, though. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push this because I'm really interested in this question. Hey, Michael Sandel. Um, <laughs> I'm really interested in this question because... Yeah, I agree. I'm down with autonomy. I'm down with pushing for autonomy. I'm kind of an autonomy kind of guy. Um, but we are denying the rich their autonomy. Straight up. Uh, they, let's imagine there's a rich guy. He said, I'm not going to pay taxes. I made this money. This is my money. I say no. This is my autonomy. This is my free choice. My my autonomy. Jiritsu, right? My, my own law. I'm making my own law. I don't have to pay. But we come down on this guy. We say, no. No, you cannot do that. We deny you that choice. We deny you that right. You have to pay. And actually, I'm for this, by the way. Yeah. Um, well, he made his money because the state was so arranged that there was a there was, a, there was an easy enough place to make the money, right? That he, that he wasn't robbed in some street or stabbed to death or... You know, he's sa he feels safe walking in the streets, right? And he, he made it kind of because we would made such a low state. Well, yeah. Imagine if, if though you know, rich people are not not betting on horses and getting rich. Some people, some of them are, but not most of them. But imagine they all are. Mm. Uh, and or they're all they're all betting. Hey, hey. <laughs> and the rules of this bet of the of this betting system entails that sometimes you when you you know you pull a losing hand or something then you lose money so this person has made all this money through this betting system and then and he pulls a losing hand and, and he say, says okay I'm autonomous this is my rule well just like you said I don't pay there's losing hand, but this is unfair because he made his money through this system. When he entered into the system, he agreed he'd, that to this possibility of losing money. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh. So, it, like, kind of, he he kind of implicitly agreed that. Yeah, he all, he had already agreed. You know, this rich person who you know they might they might might not like it that by living in. That's in th this country where we tax the rich people. Uh, he could have gone. There are countries that don't. He could have gone to a country that didn't and tried to get rich. But the fact that he got rich in a country that taxes rich people, uh, and not leave and did not leave that country, he implicitly agreed to pay this higher tax rate. Mm. Um. So, I, I like that answer. But I want to I want to keep that with, so mm -hmm. we but we do still think he owes it to the state. Yeah. Well, okay. they provided it to him. The Can I provided this opportunity? So he owes it to this in our state. He 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 agreed to participate in this state, so he owes it back. Can I work off a little bit of what kind of where Jesse was going to? I like this kind of he chose to be. It's kind of like Socrates, what he said too, actually, but. I chose to stay in Athens. Anyway, that's why I have to die. Um, I guess I can't deny that I think the state can uh, take away people's autonomy in certain aspects. Actually, I, I think I, maybe it would be maybe it's going to sound bad for me to say this, but I think that I, I'm not so much afraid as is retraining money as other aspects of the soul, right? Kind of autonomous thinking, right? And a, and these these are a little bit more important to me. So, what if I were to say, like, yes, the state can take away your autonomy, but 
we've struck a better balance than Plato did. It seems like for Plato, your entire life is in the service of the state, mm -hmm. whereas in our system, yeah, part of it is in the service of the state, but a good chunk of it is just so you can get rich and, and take selfies and put it on Twitter and, and talk about how cool you are. So <laughs> it seems like it, it, there's more of a chance to, to work for your own benefit alone. Mm. How about that? It, it, it's, it's less extreme than Plato's. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great, great. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. Because even, you know, we say that the taxes, says the taxes are not going to the state. State yeah. is, the, is the thinking. They're going to, the state then uses them for us. Mm. Yeah. Essentially, we've subordinated the state to us. Hopefully. hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, hopefully we're, we're, we're trying to make a state of autonomous individuals, right? Well, that's, that's noble lie there, but... Yeah, that is the noble lie, it really is. I mean, like, what a, what a, what a piece of crap that lie is. I mean, but if, if, we, want, if we want to go in dreamy land... Well, I do want to believe this, though. I, 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 I want that to be the truth. Mm -hmm. That, that the, the state is trying to make a collection of autonomous people. The state is trying to make a world where the state is not necessary. Mm -hmm. Right? Actually, uh, on that point, can I just do? I want to do one more thing on this. Wow, we we haven't even touched the tripart psychology. I know. Um, wow, I want to do one more thing on the state. I, okay. I, no, I'm, I'm almost hesitant to do this because like we spent so long in the state. But um, it's just when you said that, I love this point in the early, early in, the, in book four where he's talked about cutting off the heads of a hydra. Oh, boy. It was a great image. He said, like, you know, these people running around thinking, like, uh, it's even, it's like, I like it in Japan, too, where they're, like, they tell the kids, like, you got to do aisats. You got to do greeting. Every morning, you got to say ohayo gozaimasu to your teacher. Um, I, I just have kind of imagined Plato being, like, no, 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 no. You got it all backwards. Um, no matter how many little rules you lay down in your little classrooms, you're not solving the problem. The problem is in the soul. Um, the problem is in the education and in all these little rules. Like, no, you can make a million rules. It, it, the problem is not going to be solved because people just find a ways around the rules. It's kind of like a guy who sits around and, and eats, you know, potato chips or Ritz all day, <laughs> and he will not give up eating Ritz. And he's like, well, okay, doctor, just just heal me. Just, just heal me. Like, I, I keep on eating Ritz, and, and, and like, I get fat, and I, I get diseased, and i just like, oh, I try to find some doctor to heal me of my illness. But I, will, I refuse to give up my sick lifestyle. Um... And, and I'm, I'm sure the analogy here is supposed to be Socrates was killed for telling the Athenians that their lifestyle is sick. This is, I think, this is the true what Plato really wants to say here. Good. But, this is. Can I can I build off of this? This we have to. And this is going to take us to the soul. Okay. So I so want to build right on this, and I'll let, I want to build onto this. Now this is where you should have read on on us, right? Mm. This is her revolutionary. I almost think. Surprising new way of seeing Plato. Okay, so now now we take the the virtues of the city and a transfer to the soul, and then we've we've somehow somehow we've solved the problem of justice. Okay, and it, it, and somehow that this is good, right? I mean, but isn't it weird? He's like, okay, now we've solved the problem of justice. This is justice, and this is the perfectly good man. And you're kind of like, huh? What? I mean, that's not what we started talking about at all. We started talking about a guy who, you know, who, who, who attacks other people's stuff and, and takes what's not his. And what, what is this? We just talked about the soul the entire time. What, do we, what is the point of all of this? This doesn't seem like we answered the question we started on answering at all. Why on earth would you even engage in this kind of discussion? I mean, Thrasymachus could, shouldn't be satisfied at all, right? Well, what if you think about it like this, that... What Plato is doing, and I, I can't believe I didn't see this, is exactly what you said. He's Plato is trying to change people's thinking from um, an act-based ethics to an, an actor 
or or an agent based ethics, mm. right? So in other words, the reason why Cephalus was wrong, right? Cephalus too, Thrasymachus and Cephalus were both criticized, but Cephalus, all he knew how to do was follow a bunch of rules someone else laid down for him, right? But he didn't understand it. He didn't understand real justice because it wasn't in his soul. All he could do was follow a bunch of rules. That's what's wrong with Cephalus. So mm -hmm. we have to remember that Cephalus is being critiqued here too, and that's I think it's most the most important thing. But what Plato is saying is that um, the real way to get to justice is not to lay down a bunch of rules, because Plato would probably say, well, what basis do you have to lay down those rules? You can just lay down a bunch of any rules. It, so he's going to say something like this. Um, Plato has been trying to say see justice from a new perspective. He didn't want us to list things that we wanted to make good and just follow that list. He wanted to make good people. And whatever these good people do is good, mm. right? The good people are the basis of the good, mm. right? So in other words, that's why the gold people can lie, right? It's not because lying is good. It's because they're gold people that they can lie. The standard for good is the person, is the soul itself. Every, even things that appear wrong, like lying, will be okay if done by a good man. It's all up to what the good agent is and what virtues you'll have. Um, so this is this is what's played as in, which is so weird, right? Because he doesn't give any yeah. lists about what you should or shouldn't do. All he's telling you is, basically, if you're this kind of guy who has these virtues right and your soul is healthy, anything you do will be just. That's why you don't need laws in the city. That's why he's like, what do we need these laws for? That's why he skips over it totally, because good yeah. people, in his mind, they don't need laws. Anything they do is just. Because they're the kind of person that would only do just things. Just things, exactly. That's, why, that's how he skips over all these problems. He's not looking at justice from a rule-based perspective. He thinks that these agents themselves are the fundamental definition of the just, right? Whatever they do. That's justice for Plato. And I never, I can't believe it didn't occur to me until book four. Mmm, that's, wow. I like that a lot. I, I kind of want to, this is, I want to ask, I want to talk about this point. I, I think there's a very big problem. Yeah. I, I want to, yeah, I want to get into this a little. Um, so... These, what should I say? These these uh, these laws are not going to do. Well, let's just we'll just go say it very straight. So Plato seems to think that someone who's gold sold and who's got a good education, it, it's just going to be second nature or obvious to this guy what the right thing to do is. Um, I'm, this might take us a little bit outside of the book, but I think it's, it's just this flat out wrong. I mean, it's just just intuitively wrong. I mean, it's just based on. I mean, this is Plato's ra moral rationalism here, uh, speaking out volumes. He thinks it's obvious. It'll be obvious to a gold soul guy what to do. So, like, let's take Jean Paul Sartre here in his 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 little essay, "Existentialism is a Humanism," where he had that 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 guy who came to him, and he said, "Hey, Jean Paul Sartre, you're you're a smart guy. What should I do? My mother is sick." And I need to take care of her, but also I should I want to go and fight the Nazis. What should I do? Um, it's not obvious. It is not obvious what to do. And no matter how gold sold you are, it will never be obvious what you should do. I, I think just just there, boom. I, I think this, he, Plato cannot surmount this. Okay. Well, then I want to throw that right back in your face and say mm. that existentialism suffers from the exact same problem. Existentialism really has no ethics. As long as you're authentic, any choice you make is fine. You could be an authentic Nazi, too, couldn't you? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, I think if your only basis is authenticity, you, you're screwed. Um... But I think, I hope, although I don't think so, I, I hope Jean-Paul Sartre, wow, come on, Jean-Paul Sartre, don't let me down. I hope what he was trying to do there was not to say that whatever you decide is right. 
he was trying to say that um, there is no way to decide between two radical alternatives some in some cases there there are some cases in which the alternatives are so radical it requires a kind of fundamental choice and uh, no amount of self-reflection or, or s internal reflection will decide the issue you have to just dive into one of them and like I'm sure like Jean Paul Sartre because you know you're right. There was a third alternative: join the Nazis for this guy, and like Jean Paul Sartre misses a lot on this. But I'm sure in Jean Paul Sartre's mind, he was thinking something along, along the lines of joining the Nazis was unthinkable for this guy. He was he only had two alternatives: fight the Nazis or, or help his sick mother, right? And how could he decide between him? And Jean Paul Sartre's point was like, sorry, man. There's, there's no, there is no fundamental moral law that's going to help you choose between these two. Nothing. It's oh, yeah? up okay. to you. Well, let me help Plato out then. Okay. I want to say that being a Nazi was unthinkable to him because he was the kind of man that had the correct virtues that he would not choose that. Ah. Uh, so you mean like this guy is existentialist on the on the basis of a platonic education? Well, he's got a certain kind of virtue ethics, right? True. I, I agree. I agree. I think Jean-Paul Sartre, this is where Jean-Paul Sartre actually misses out a lot. However, the, the, the main, I guess, wow. Well, wow, you got me cornered here a little bit. I guess the point is, it's not obvious which one you should do. But they are both are good alternatives. You're right. We're, we're choosing between two good alternatives. But those alternatives are good because he has certain virtues that yeah. he believes in. Fundamental virtues, which Jean-Paul himself said. And I remember reading, reading this in Being in Nothingness. He said, basically, you're, they're almost brought out of the darkness, the blackness, right? I mean, like, mm. th these are kind of fundamental base choices for him, at any rate, right? Yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, like... I, I get what you're saying. I really like what you're saying in, the, in, in defense of this, but it seems like ex in, in this in stoicism too suffers from this problem. And also bring this up that stoicism too suffers from this problem of kind of anything being almost acceptable to these people, mm -hmm. right? But but Plato, I mean, because it seems weird because Plato's big problem here is exactly what you're talking about. I mean, this is if I were to say to Plato, I like what your problem is. Sometimes you don't know the answer, right? And then I would also say to Plato, so Plato has a big problem here because he seems to provide no argument as to why the good man should only have those four virtues that the Greeks had loved. The Greeks, the four virtues the Greeks loved were wisdom, uh, courage, moderation, and justice. I mean, but those were simply Greek virtues. They, they were there for greats, right? But he doesn't provide any argument as to why it should only be those four. I know that the soul had to be healthy and unified for it to be good. Okay, that's kind of an interesting argument. But what about humility, love, compassion, or ambition? What argument could Plato have to show that the four virtues and only those can pose a healthy soul? I don't think he has one. I don't think he has an argument at all for this. I don't think so either. So he's in a real danger here. Well, probably in the world when he was writing this, that wouldn't have had to, to be argued. Yeah, that's right. I think you're exactly right. These were accepted virtues of the good man. But yeah. he doesn't provide them. I mean, like, if, if he actually really is doing an agent-based mm. ethics, he has to somehow objectively justify what makes a good agent. And he, he hasn't done that. Big, big problem. A good agent is a Greek. <laughs> <laughs> the rest there you barbarians. Barbarians. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> this, is my, this is my last argument against Plato this time. Mm. It plays, I love Plato's agent-centered virtue. I, this, to me, this is a revelation um, in, in my understanding of Plato. It's a new way. I mean, now we're thinking about it. I don't see why. Because of his constant talk about education. I mean, just think about it. Why on earth would he be talking about education if it weren't for this? Mm. Right? 
I mean, this is why it's fundamental. This is why education can make or break a city. It's because it makes the kind of person that creates the good itself. Mm. Um, so I, I really like Anas's take on this, but wow, I think he's got a big problem for those two reasons. The reason you said, right, that these choices are not obvious, and he's provided no argument that these four virtues and only these are the ones that we need. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I this is what hit me. Oh, I like your point a lot. I like that a lot. Um, just the fact that these aren't obvious, and I, I don't want to... Wow. I, I'm going to sound a little sappy here. I don't want to stand up for stupid people a lot. But I think a lot of stupid people... Not a lot. At least some stupid people, they, they don't have, like, ill will in their heart a lot of time, but they're making a lot of bad choices. Um... There might have even been a nice guy Nazi, you yeah. know what I mean, who was loyal and had wisdom, but I just didn't have the foresight to see what was really going on. Um, well, anyway, uh, what did you think? Can I ask one? I was just wow, one very side point on this. Did this remind you of uh, Ivan Karamazov from the Brothers, <laughs> where who said he wanted to turn the state into a church? Yeah, because that that was how he was going to solve the problem of people committing crime. He's going to turn the state into a church, and then people who committed crime would 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 decrease because they'd feel like they were committing acts against God, and not against the state. Mm -hmm. um, and well, it's it's even more interesting because Ivan is kind of an atheist. Yeah. <laughs> Kind of, right? I think he, 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 Ivan's an atheist. But, yeah, and wait, also, he, but he, he sees, he sees the devil. Yeah, <laughs> he's an atheist. He sees the devil, but don't they all? Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, but anyway, uh... boy, any anything else you want to say about either the Soul City Division, the Divided Soul, or how Plato answers the question of the just man? Or, or the good, do good life. The initial challenge brought up by Thersinicus. I mean, it's really complicated. This part is really complicated. I mean, it's gonna. It's, I think it really should sound weird to everybody about how. I mean, like, does this answer Thersinicus's question? Mm. Um, it's got to sound quite odd. But I think if you think about it as an agent-based ethics, you're getting. We're getting a little closer. Mm. But it, it doesn't seem like the virtues. I mean, the city and the soul don't transfer to each other very well because. You know, in, in the in the soul, right, there's only a desiring part. But in the city, there is a man who has a little bit of reason, a little bit of spirit, and a, little, a lot of desire, right? So these don't exactly transfer to each other very well. A lot of the objections I brought up against the city don't work against the individual. Mm. Right? It doesn't seem like these fit well together. Um, like you said, Jesse, too, like some of these work better if you think about them as an individual. Than the city. Yeah. We didn't discuss actually justice, by the way, much. Just like minding your own business is the definition of justice. That is probably one of the biggest revelations of this entire thing, too, right? Yeah. Like, first of all, it's, it's kind of awesome. And weird. <laughs> and really weird, too, by the way, but it's kind of awesome. Like, we should actually, that should be our t shirt. So, yeah. mind, mind your own business. Play actually, I've thought about this. Like, in my image. I want to have, like, a a guy who he's he sees like these mobsters about to shoot a man, and and one of the and one of the mobsters comes up to him and says, "Why don't you act justly?" <laughs> um, I, I just want to ask, like, um, it, as strange as minding your own business is as a definition of justice, I mean, of course, I just I just love the translation because it. And it, so it fits in with what Plato is thinking. He's thinking of rubberneckers and people who stick their noses in where they don't belong. Um, it's, but, like, even in our modern democracy now, it, it doesn't it hurt a little bit when someone says, do you mind your own business? Mm. Tell me it doesn't hurt. It hurts. Come on. Yeah. It hurts. It's almost like even in our democracy... People, when they tell you mind your own business, they're saying you are overstepping mm. morally some grounds that you should not be overstepping, right? Or, just we're, we're a little bit vaguer about the whole thing. Yeah. 
or sometimes they mean, mean you're not uh, worthy of engaging in this. Yeah. You bronze person. Exactly. In a weird way, it fits right in with this, doesn't it? Like, you're not worthy of getting in on this. Mind your own business. Like, I'm waiting for the gold people to come on and tell me <laughs> what to do. Yeah. I mean, I, he did suggest in one line that justice is the fundamental virtue that makes all the other virtues work or possible. Mm. Right? He said that only in one line. Basically. But he also goes on to say, well, each one is a very important virtue, but justice is kind of like the foundational virtue. Mm. You know, so if, 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 the, if, the, if the desires and the spirit were all, you know, acting crazy and doing other things, the other ones couldn't really work, right? You wouldn't mm. have the moderation, wisdom, or courage to do anything. I, I just thought it was weird. I mean, going back at least to my very first objection to what is the city won. Um, so he, he kind of suggests that justice is the fundamental virtue that makes the city possible. But it seems like Plato also says, well, the city can't be too rich either because then people would just slack off. Well, it kind of seems like economic conditions also can make justice possible. Mm. I mean, like, both of them kind of form each other. Right? The city is made possible by justice, but justice is also made possible by a city. See, I, I, it kind of it makes me wonder, if, well, what is foundational here? I mean, it seems like both of them need each other. Right, you need a good environment as well as a good soul to keep that justice running. At least he seems to suggest that. Yeah. Well, admittedly, if the, this is says the uh, the Christian question about the the poor man stealing a loaf of bread to feed his family, it's like, okay, is he just or is unjust? Well, we wouldn't have to ask if he could buy his own bread. Yeah. Yeah. Or eat cake. Or eat cake. Or eat cake. Pastries. Pastries, yeah, those pastries. Pastries. So, um, but let's I get know. to the tripartite side soul here. All right. <laughs> we, we are, we kind well, of, we're kind of there. But yeah, we're kind what do you want to say about, I mean, like, the only thing I want to say about the tripartite soul is I love this idea of dividing the soul. Me too. I, who, who knew that Plato was, like, I don't know, maybe one of the first psychologists? I mean, yeah. I mean, I think it's a really fundamental insight. I mean, he's wrong, but it's a really fundamental insight. And I, I love the objections that, that, that came up. I mean, like, for example, mm. what happens when, yeah, I can see getting a drink and then not wanting a drink because, you know, your intellect says, well, that's not going to be good for you. You shouldn't have a drink now. But, like, you know, what if two different desires come up? Like, I want a drink and I want to eat. Okay, right? So what do you do now, right? You can't divide the desiring part from the desiring part. So it, it kind of seems like Plato's theory allows for almost infinite parts of the soul. I, I kind of I I agree, but maybe the, the, I guess the issue here is that um, <coughs> those, those wow well, well, I'm gonna have to get straight on us here. I'm gonna go straight on Nas, but this I is know, I'm really interested in do. this. But different like types those two of... desires, those two desires are are contingently. Contradictory, yeah. only contingently. Like it, it's not n logically necessary for I want to drink and I want to eat to be contradictory. But I want to drink and I don't want to drink are necessarily contradictory. Um, but for example, I want to watch a movie and I, I, I want to eat ice cream. Maybe I have to go to Baskin Robbins so I can't watch the movie. But that's contingently contradictory. I, Plato is really interested in necessarily contradictory desires, right? Mm. Okay. Um, so what did you make of... I guess what I felt the most was that it seems like it's an unfair divide because it seems like the desiring parts have their own rationality, mm. and rationality has its own desiring parts. So it seems like there's, they're, they're more mixed up than he's willing to admit. I totally agree that there are, there are definitely... Wow, yeah, Plato is, suffers a lot in this that they're more mixed up than he's willing to admit but um, I mean, for, uh, what about love of money that's actually a very complicated desire yeah don't you think I think I just I just want to say like I think um, for example I want a cheeseburger is a different kind of desire than I'm not going to cheat on my test um, 
though is I'm not going to cheat on my test. Is that I don't or? want to cheat on my test. Maybe the answer sheet is in front of me, and I don't want to. Or maybe, maybe like I don't know, what would be good? Like, what what else would be good? I I want to help the old woman across the street. I, um, mm. I think it's a fundamentally different kind of desire. Mm. I want a cheeseburger, and I want to help the old woman across the street. Um, no, I don't. It seems like um, Plato doesn't really see these positive desires. He well, talk. I mean, like, he places this in spirit. Mm. And this is why spirit is one of my favorite parts of the soul. Um, because I it covers I, what I'm interested in. I didn't like what Anna said about spirit. Oh, she said, like... I she I liked what she, where she was dividing it up, but she said like yeah, it can't be emotion because that means it's kind of too. Um, what did she say? No, God, let me catch. Mm. Sorry. Um, yeah, I know. She she said oh, there he goes. Um, too suggestive of a mere reaction. Yeah. No, I the it, for some reason immediately I thought spirit was closer to emotion than anything else. Yeah. Um, and emotions well, especially aren't Robert reactive. Solomon's ideas of emotion, yeah. right? I was like, no, emotions aren't reactive. Actually, I mean, they they have rationality and they they can be more than just reactive forces, right? They're actually strategies for living in the world. I think so. I, I was trying to kind of like push emotion into spirit because I was trying to figure out. I like this tripartite division. And I was trying to figure out where I would put different things that I felt are left out, like the unconscious and emotions. And I was going to put emotions into spirit. Just the, the problem is, I think, Plato, Thumos, right? This is what he, spirit is, Thumos. It's very close to emotion. It's close, very close to things Robert Solomon says about emotion. Mm. Um, but Plato is really wants to emphasize it's something along the lines of something what we like, drive. Drive. Just, just, just sheer drive to excel, to succeed, to conquer, to dominate, mm. to, 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 to move to that next level is, is implicit in this. Um, although, like a lot of the stuff Anas says about like the structure of Thumos, the th structure fits in so nicely. with yeah. Emotion theory, right? You could just take it right there. You, I'm, I'm always tempted just to throw out. Thumos and replace it with emotion in, in like a Robert Solomon kind of way. If I was gonna modify Plato's, well, then how would you how would you save wisdom then? Because I mean, what are you gonna leave left for wisdom? What, what are you giving wisdom then? If you're taking emotions and desire, and and what are you giving to this ethereal kind of wisdom? If you I, can't, it does it have desire itself too? It must. Yeah, I mean, it, it's gotta, ha it's gotta, but it's gotta. Wow. Desire for the truth. Desire for the real. Exactly. It's gotta be something like this. I mean, it's gotta be some kind of very. It's gotta be a drier kind of like desire for, or I mean, a wisdom would be reason, reason, or I, I, I would place it a more. A desire like reason. for reason. Re reason would be something along the lines of a, a kind of a dry appraisal of the truth. No. Um, judgment. There's, there's got to be something motivational. In like, so if you could separate judgment from emotion, I would definitely throw judgment in the case of reason. But judgment isn't separate from the emotion. But I, I just want to say, like, yeah. maybe if we were making categories, like, I would throw judgment itself in reason. But of course, emotion cannot operate without judgment. But, but so, like. Thumos or spirit operates as 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 a subordinate of re subordinate of reason, so I think like Thumos works or, or spirit works most effectively when it's subordinated with reason when it's got these judgments, right? O other than like just being just being sheer reactionary, dumb emotions. You're like, oh bug, oh I'm hungry, mm. oh you're pretty, I love you, right? The more it's paired with reason, the more it's paired with judgment that. And I really like what Anas was saying about this, like, and, and Plato was saying about this, like, how, how reason sees things as a whole, mm. how reason is able to capture a person as a whole, how reason is able to avoid simple, wait, wait, what did Plato say, like, fear and pleasure and pain and desire of the present moment. Reason is able to take you outside of the present. Reason is able to expand you, stretch you over time. 
to the past and to the future, right? This would be the reasoning section of you. I, this is why I would put all this stuff, right? Mm. This, this this would this doesn't exactly fit in with emotion, I think. Yeah, because you remember he's he said that uh, it was Plato who oh, called the in the the spirit that the reason is in the gold all the class was the calculating. Yeah. It almost seems like you're you're actually maybe separating emotion, Jim. The because you know, Robert Solomon said that there's a strategic component, and and towards emotion, maybe he played it with separate that strategic component and put that into the calculate. I mean, where the spirited would would be, it's it, it's not entirely you know this thumos is not entirely emotion, because mm -hmm. it seems very odd to say that you have. You want your soldiers to be emotional, mm -hmm. you know? but I can see how you know maybe he separates this out. You know, the the gold calculating part of your mind says, "Okay, anger, go," mm -hmm. oh, and then the anger goes because it's subordinate and to this calculating part of the mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. Hmm. So, I, what, okay, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I want to say I just I one of the reasons I like the tripartite psychology. I just, I mean, this is the beginning of kind of a psychological understanding of people, and in in this sense, like, I want to say like I kind of I'm gonna throw Plato in a little bit with Nietzsche here. Who thought the soul was not one? Who thought yeah. the soul was like you're the product of a working out of a lot of different drives and desires? Um, Although he would have probably put intellect more into just a competing yeah, yeah. drive. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Well, that aside, we could talk some Nietzsche later. But um, I like this simply in the sense that um, it, it this is the kind of idea, this is the kind of thinking that, that cuts through your, my, at least my feeling of falsity when people say, I'm just being me. Wow. I'm just an angry guy. Uh, I, I, you, know what I, you know how I am. I'm just inquisitive. That's why I asked all those rude questions. It cuts right through that. I mean, it's... These kind of people are treating themselves as a unity, as 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 if there's nothing inside of you fighting <laughs> this, as mm. if there's there's just one thing. I desired to ask rude questions, so I did. Mm. No, 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 no. It, there, there, there are multiple parts of you. You don't know what you're gonna do or you don't know what you're going to desire. There's a lot of desires going on inside of you. There's a lot of things popping up in you. There's the thumos and there's your desire for a cheeseburger and, and you're thinking about what you're going to do next week and, and, and your reason is telling you you got to think about your career and retirement and all this stuff is going on in your head and out of a, a lot of stuff... Okay, yeah, you, you, maybe you ask some rude questions. Maybe there's a, there's a pattern to this, but like... Well, I'm bringing Sartre in here so much. People hide behind this. Like, I'm just a rude guy. What am I going to do? Mm. What, what are you going to do? No, no. I think this cuts straight through this. No? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Especially if you, if you separate, you know, calculating from emotions. Mm. And make the emotions subordinate to calculating is what as Sartre is, is trying to do here. here. I really like... Actually, that's one of the things I like about Solomon the most is that he says, you know, emotions are strategies. No, you're not just angry. You're angry for a reason. Mm, and yes. There's rationale to it. Definitely, yes. Exactly. Uh, which is, this is one of the reasons I like this tripart psycholo tripartite psychology mm. a lot. Mm. Oh, yeah, no, certainly. We, actually, the, mo the thing I like the most about it was he, how he has kind of this, the example about this curse in your eyes. Mm. Um, is this really seems 
yeah, real. And, you know, it's it's powerful. You know, you berate yourself when you let desire fear get the best of you. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Like when you read that, I love this story of what is it, Leonides, um, oh Leonides God. or something. Um, when you read that, did you understand that he was cursing his eyes? Oh yeah. Did yeah. you? Did that come across to you? I, I the first the first time I read it, it did not come across. What did, to what me. did you think he was cursing? I had no idea. I was just it was just weird. Like just my first reaction, by the way. After of course looking back at it, I understood. But like my first reaction was like he said. Look on this beautiful sight, you wretches. Look, you damned wretches. Take your fill of the fair sight, yeah. Of the fair sight, like, well, okay, wow, I'm going to sound like this Dickensteinian alien who thinks the old man with the cane is going up the hill, but, like, w couldn't he be talking to the corpses? <laughs> no, no, no. I assumed he was talking to, to the two hoes he was taking with him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, like, in in the in the sen in the paragraph itself, it never says he cursed his eyes. It just all of a sudden it says, "Look, you wretches, on this beautiful sight." It it, it, it never isn't says. Isn't it strange that you were? It, it, I think it's bizarre that you were confused there when you should have been confused. Is why on earth is he looking at dead bodies? Which which we know why actually, right? <laughs> I mean, we know why because he had possibly a sexual desire for them. <laughs> is possibly necrophilia. Uh, I mean, because there's some kind of legend in Greece that he liked boys that were kind of almost dead pale, right? So he would like modern, like, uh, fashion shows. With yeah, the, the, basically. The, the, wow, the, the I, I assumed he was just, he was just rubbernecking. Yeah. I thought he was doing that too, but the, the commentary seemed to suggest there was more than rubbernecking here. Okay. And I was like, okay, that is bizarre. That didn't come across. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, I did not... I, I saw that he was cursing his eyes. I assume this was just like, you know, when you're driving the highway way and you don't want to look at that dead squirrel. Yeah. On the side of the road, you're just like... Or like Goatsy or something, right? Or yeah. YouTube comments. Or YouTube... Oh, yeah. Or YouTube oh, comments. Except for our comments. Except for our comments. And, no, really, we greatly appreciate your comments. <laughs> We're talking about the, the commenters on lesser videos. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Lesser on, on the bronze videos. Yes. Those, yeah. those are the ones that are like squirrels. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We appreciate it, the comments from our gold viewers. Yes. Gold members, as we call them. <laughs> uh, uh, Boy, is there anything... We, we, we spent way too long on this book, which is a great book, and I think we could, we could go on for... So long. I mean, we we could touch more about the city soul comparison, which I think doesn't quite work some ways, and more about the tripartite soul, and actually about is the question answered. But wow, I think we've talked for long enough. Um, anything you guys want to say, or are we gonna shut this thing down? Um, I just want to remind all of our viewers, please comments. And see, we've said our things about the the city soul analogy. Please give us your opinion. Ends, ends. Maybe you think it works, maybe you think it doesn't. Then please explain why. Uh, we look forward to reading the demo. We thank you for watching you know, us throughout all of this. Mm. Definitely. Anything else? No? Yeah. I think there is still a lot to be said. Book four is an incredible book. I really enjoyed this book. I think I this is I think I've enjoyed book one the most and book mm. four the second most. Mm. Um, Although the idea of this divided soul in book four is probably, what I think, the most powerful idea so far um, that I've enjoyed. So mm. um, I'm looking forward to book five, which is going to touch on feminism. So if you're interested in feminism and, and a lot of other crazy things um, in book five, um, please join us next week. We'll talk about some platonic feminism. All right. We're going to sign off now.